Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. God is indeed faithful to provide. He will move according to his truth, and he will do so at his appointed times. Israel, they have been in bondage for many, many years, through many generations. But because of the faithfulness of a few, as we studied last week, those midwives who feared God, who served him, who did things according to his will, not according to the threats of Pharaoh. God saw their faithfulness, and God began to move in that next generation. That generation, too, bring forth his redemption. And notice what we see here. Because of their faithfulness of these two women, it moved another woman to be faithful. And this is the mother of Moshe Rabbeinu, Yocheved. And this woman feared God as well. Take out your Bibles and look with me to the book of Exodus. And now we're ready for Exodus chapter 2. We see how God works in order to bless his people one family as a time. And never underestimate what one family can do. Look at verse 1. We read here, and a man from the house of Levi, that is a Levite. Biblically, we know that in a unique way, that tribe has been called in a unique purpose to be servants, spiritual leaders, but servants nevertheless for the rest of the tribes. Now, when we think of the Levites, there's another group of people that usually come into our mind, the Kohanim, the priests. But realize something. All priests, they derive from Aaron, who we've already met. Aaron, for example, the brother of Moshe Rabbeinu. And we know something, that the priests come from Aaron, but they're still part of that same tribe, the Levites. So God is going to work with those who have a call in their life. The Levites. Look again at verse 1. And a man from the house of Levites, the Levi, he went forth. Now, this is important because we see this man acting in faithfulness. He went forth, and notice what it says. He took from the daughter of Levi, that is, from the tribe of the Levites, he took a wife. Now, this mentions something to us, because marriage, whenever a family is, is built, and that's what we're talking about here. When this man went, and this means he walked. Why is that important? Because it speaks about a lifestyle. It speaks about behavior. Now, biblically, we learn later on that there is an emphasis for Levites to marry Levites, for priests to marry daughters of other priests because this call to be a Levite is a very stringent one. And it assists, it's not an absolute mandate, but it is a strong spiritual recommendation because a daughter of a Levite, she would be raised in a home with this stringentness, with this call. And therefore, she would be more appropriate, more accustomed to what it meant to be a Levite in a house of Levites. She would be better able to marry another Levite. So traditionally, we see that Levites would marry daughters of Levites. And that's exactly what happened here. It shows that this man, who would be the father of Moses, that this man took his call seriously. Now, some would argue and say, but wait a second. The Torah has not been given. That's true. 
but God has revealed truth. He has those that have heard his voice, like Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, and those individuals that God has spoken to, revealed his word. And apparently, Levite, he has taken hold of this, and he's someone who wants to walk with the Lord. And that's why the first word in chapter 2 is this word, Vayelech, and he walked. This man from the house of Levi. And he took from the daughter of the Levites. And notice what happened, verse 2. Now, the message is this. Even though, and realize, this was difficult times. There was an emphasis from Pharaoh to exterminate the Jewish people, killing all the male children, those who were going to be born. We talked about that last week. But this man didn't lose faith. This man didn't see an end in future. Rather, he saw a beginning, that God would be faithful, and therefore he didn't look at the situation with hopelessness. Why should I get married? If I get married and have a child, if it's a son, it's just going to be tossed into the Nile. He didn't see it this way. He went out of obedience, believing the word of God. Now remember, the word of God says, be fruitful and multiply here again. Did the people have the written word? They did not. But the revelation of God was available through prophecy. And we see that Moses, he received prophecy, but before him, we need to remember the patriarchs heard from God. So he took from the daughter of a Levite, and notice verse 2, it says, and she, that is the woman, conceived. Now, normally, when conception is mentioned, it is shown by the presence of God, that he's at work in the situation. He is wanting to bless because children are a heritage from the Lord. They are the fruit or the blessing of the womb. So God is still moving. God is still blessing. He still has purpose. So this woman conceived, and notice she bears a son. And this son, notice it says, and she looked at him, ki tov hu. Now, I don't know how it's translated in your Bible, but ki tov hu means for. She looked and she saw that he was good. Now, many English Bibles, they will translate it that he was handsome, that he was, was you know, someone of fair uh, uh, look presentation, but all of that is wrong. It's a simple Hebrew word, tov, which means good. And why is it significant? Because the word tov, meaning good, should be understood as relating to the will of God. Now, I share that often. It's important. Words appear over and over. And the purpose for this appearing of the same words is to teach us truth. So she saw how we should rightly understand it. She saw that this young child, this one who was just born, that he was good, meaning he was related to the will of God. Now, the husband, he wanted, when he walked and took a wife, he wanted to fulfill. He saw a future. But here in chapter 2, we're going to see that there's an emphasis on the mother of Moses. We're not going to encounter Amram, the husband of Yocheved, that is, the father of Moses, for several chapters. The emphasis is going to be on the woman, on the mother. She's the one that saw, at, as she looked at this child, that he was connected to the will of God. So what should she do? Well, the law was that a son had to be cast into the Nile. But what did she do? She hid this child. And notice what it says, Shlosha Yerachim. Now, Yerach is moon. But Yerech can also be an ancient Hebrew word for month. Today we have the word Chodesh. It also appears in the Bible. But the word Yerech, meaning moon, and it's used as a month because every new moon, there's a new month. 
So she hid this son of hers for three months. Now, three can be a number for testing. For example, when Yeshua, he tested Peter when he says, do you love me three times? So this woman, she was tested and she hid her son, keeping him alive for three months. Look at verse three. But it came about when she could no longer hide him. What did she do? When it was beyond her own ability, it says that she took him, and this is what it says, and a basket. Now, your Bible says basket. Realize something. It is the same word for ark, not the ark of the covenant. This would be our own. But it's the word teva, which is ark, like in Noah's ark. Now, this is significant because Noah and his family eight people all together they wanted a new beginning and that new beginning was going to be provided by God for them through being in the ark and the message here is this same word is selected now I realize that in English they don't like the word ark here because we think of this large boat and the context here is something much smaller but it is sad when we think that we should alter the scripture by giving it a different translation than it has in the book of Genesis. No, Moses, he was placed in that ark, what we call a basket frequently, but he was placed in that ark because she did so with that same faith, that same trusting of God that, that Noah had and his family when they entered into the ark. Look again at verse 3. And she, when she was no longer able anymore to hide him, she took him and, notice, an ark. An ark of, and uh, once more, don't know how it's translated in your Bible, but it speaks about the same type of plant that we get papyrus from. What we, we write on long ago, ancient paper. And she took this, this papyrus, and she used it with something. It says that she, with kind of like asphalt. Now, she uses two words here, asphalt, and that's another word which means asphalt. Sometimes in Bibles, they call it pitch, but it's something that is sticky, something that is used for a sealer. So with this, this type of asphalt and sealer, what did she do? She sealed up this ark. She made it so it would float this papyrus and we keep reading on it says and she put in it in the ark the child now this is word yell it and by the way we find the same word in a different form but same shorsh same root word being used to describe messiah as well so Moses is the first redeemer and Mashiach Yeshua he's the final redeemer but this word should cause us to think about Messiah look again she set in it in the ark the child and she set it in the suf suf is the reeds now we're talking about uh, reeds that grow out of the water near the shore so she put, just like Noah's ark entered into water because of the flood, in that same way we find that she put her ark, much smaller, with only one uh, passenger, Moses, she put it as well in the, the river by these reeds on the shore of the Nile. Verse 4. And she stationed. Now, it's a word to take a stand or to be positioned. And it's interesting because this is the same word that appears later on in the book of Exodus when uh, Moses and the children of Israel, that they stood on the other side 
of the Red Sea. And they saw the salvation, the salvation that God provided. That is when he brought them through the Red Sea and Pharaoh and his troops were defeated. So this language, it foreshadows, we see it elsewhere in regard to God's faithfulness to his people. And therefore, God's going to be faithful once more in this situation. Look now again to verse 4. She stationed, this is uh, uh, the mother, Yocheved. She stationed his sister at a distance. Why? To know what would be done to him. Now, she just didn't put him in and forget it. She put a watchman, in this case, a woman, his older sister, to be there to look out and to see what came about. She wasn't washing her hands of her son. She was doing something that I believe that the word of God placed upon her heart to do in order to teach us, in order to teach us about deliverance. How God brought, brought the children of, of Noah and his wife and their spouses. How he brought them to a new beginning. God here in the choice of these words were communicating to us that there was going to be a new beginning for the children of Israel. Verse, verse 5. Verse 5, we're not focusing any longer on the family of Moses but on Pharaoh's family. Now, here we're seeing the providence of God because, you know, many people would go down to the Nile in order to bathe. People would go and do many things along the seashore. It was used for a variety of purposes, but it just so happened at the time and at the place where they placed that small ark with Moses inside into the water along the shore. At that time, at that place, who happened to come? We'll look at verse 5. And the daughter of Pharaoh went down to bathe in the Nile. And she went there with her young ladies. That means, and it's a word here, narotecha, with her young attendants. So we don't know how old the daughter of Pharaoh was, but she had young women attending to her needs. So she would go down there. They would carry perhaps the towel and her clothes and such, and they would also serve as kind of a lookout to make sure no one would come where she was bathing. It was a reference to modesty. And therefore, notice what it says, verse 5. The daughter of Pharaoh, at that moment, at that place, went down, went down to bathe in the Nile with her young ladies with her. And they walked along the Nile. And she saw, notice, she saw the ark in the midst of the reed. That is, along these, these reeds that would come up from the water she saw and notice she saw this uh, ark and she sent for her her maidservant that she would take it now notice here according to the hebrew pronouns she saw this this ark and it captured her attention what was it doing there now, it was probably made from those same reeds, but it was made in a unique way, like the ark. And it captured her attention. She sent a maidservant in order to take it, and the word here, it, refers not to Moses. She didn't know Moses was in it, but to take the ark, verse 6. She took it, and it says, verse 6, and she opened up, and she saw him, that is Moses. Notice it says again, this is the second time, et hayelet, the child. And behold, and there's a change in word, na'ar. Now normally, na'ar is used throughout Hebrew, 
more often than not, to refer to a young teenager. So we have a tinok, a baby. Then a yelet, a small child. And then a na'ar, and then bachur, and then finally ish. So it's somewhat unusual, but in many places in the scripture, a na'ar can also be referred to an infant. What's the significant? Usually, when a baby is referred to by this Hebrew word, it is to show significance. And that's exactly its use here. There is significance with this child. What is it? He is connected to the will of God. Let me say that a different way. He is connected to the will of God. And for some reason, Pharaoh's daughter, when she looked, that message, not necessarily the will of God, but something unique she saw in this child. And the moment that she was looking at him, notice, Boche, this young infant, he cried out. And with that cry, so she saw and she heard and notice she had compassion upon him. Now, there's another thing that, that really stands out in this text. She is Pharaoh's daughter. We're going to see in a moment, she knew what this young child was, this baby boy. She knew the order that the Hebrew infants that were male, they had to be put to death. But she was Pharaoh's daughter. See, other women they might fear to disobey Pharaoh. To disobey Pharaoh could mean a great punishment, even death. But she was Pharaoh's daughter, and I hope you see the providence. I mean, she could get away with what other young women couldn't. What other young women wouldn't even want to get away with. But when she heard that child cry, it says here, that she had compassion, she took pity. And furthermore, she said from, she said, from the children of the Hebrews is this one. So she knew the situation very well, but she didn't care. She, because of what touched her heart, this mercy, she was going to raise this child verse 7 now the mother remember she just didn't say i'm trusting you god i'm putting him into the water and that's it she had her daughter who we will know later on is miriam miriam was there she was watching to see what would happen and immediately look at verse 7 his sister, this would be Miriam, his sister said to the daughter of Pharaoh. Now, she's there and she speaks to Pharaoh's daughter and she says, Shall I go and call for you a woman from the Hebrews to nurse? That is a nurse from the Hebrews, meaning the Hebrew women, that she would nurse for you at Hayelet, once more, this child. Now, this is the third time other words are used to describe him, but this is the third time that this word and phrase, et Hayelet, the child, is mentioned. And I mentioned that this word specifically is used in regard to Mashiach as well, the Messiah. So she comes, she would have been known, from her language, from her accent, because the Hebrews all lived in Goshen. They learned the language of the Egyptians, but according to tradition, they did not lose Hebrew. They spoke their own language. They retained it. So she would have been known by Pharaoh's daughter to be a Hebrew child herself. And she went and she says, do you want me to fetch for you? Not for him, not for us, for you. Do you want me to bring a nurse 
from the Hebrew women in order that you, through her, can nurse this, this young child. Verse 8. And she said to her, that is, Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go, and she went, and notice what she's called. She's called Ha'alma. Now, this is important because this is the word that's used in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. Remember what it says, a virgin shall conceive and bear a child. Why is that important? Because that word as well, Alma, is used in regard to Messiah. And here's what's important. Messiah is Redeemer, and therefore this word Alma should also be, be given to us in the context of redemption. In other words, throughout this passage, God is communicating with the reader through the selection of words that were inspired to be written down. He is screaming out redemption, redemption. This all has to do with God's plan to redeem his people out of bondage. Now, I want to talk a few minutes about this word, Alma. Now, there's debate, liberal individuals, those who doubt the authority of Scripture. I was speaking to my wife, Rivka, this evening as we were coming back from our study, and I mentioned a professor that I had in seminary. And even though he was a very nice guy, he was very uh, uh, confident, meaning not insecure, because I vehemently disagreed with him. And I remember asking him, why do you interpret this verse this way? And the message was this. There was something supernatural God was doing. But instead of looking at it from prophecy, from God speaking forth something miraculous that he was going to do, rather he gave a different interpretation. He didn't see it with future implications, but something that happened in the past, and he did not give it a supernatural context, but something physical. And I asked him, why is it? That, that, that people, oftentimes in seminaries, why do they want to explain away the supernatural? Why do they want to always look at prophecy saying, well, this is prophecy, but it spoke about a past event, not something with any future ramifications? I don't understand why these individuals enter in to that type of, of call, profession, labor, work if they just want to doubt the authority and the power of God. So many people want to look at this word Alma and what is written in Isaiah 7, 14 and just say, you know, all this word means is a young woman. I mentioned the word Na'ar for a young man. Now, in the feminine, we have Na'ara. And there's many, in fact, if you would do a study you would find that many times people in uh, theological writings, in reference books, they will tell you that the word Alma is a mila nirdefet, a synonym for the word nara, meaning just a young woman. That is false. The word nara means a young woman. It's a very generic word. But the word Alma has to do with a woman of righteousness. That means a woman who is committed to the will of God. And to be committed to the will of God, you have to be committed to the word of God. And here's the message. There she was, faithful in carrying out her calling. Now, if we're speaking about a woman, a woman who is unmarried, who is serious about the word of God and is a righteous woman, if she's not married, she's going to be a virgin. So this word should rightly be defined as a righteous young woman who has never been with a man. That's an alma. 
And it's usually attached to that which is related to the will of God, the purposes of God. So that's why here in the text, in verse 8, where it says, and the Alma, and it's Ha Alma, and the young woman, righteous, godly, connected to the will of God, the purposes of God, this Alma went and she called the mother, and here's the fourth time, of the Yelid, of this child. Now, what's important is this. I mean, the mother is being brought right back immediately into the life of Moses. Why is that? Because she is going to disciple him. She is going to be an influence in Moses' life. And we're going to see because of the influence of his mother, that Moses is going to see himself differently. And how is that? Well, next week, when we continue on in our study, we're going to see that Moses goes forth. He leaves Pharaoh's house. Now realize something. He is a man now. He was raised to be the son of Pharaoh in that environment. But here's what's important. He did not have an Egyptian identity. He had an identity with the Hebrews. And where do you think that came from? There's only one answer according to the context of Scripture. And that is because of the influence, the discipleship of Yocheved, his mother. She raised him with the identity of one of the Hebrews. She was highly influential in his life. Look again. We find that that this Alma, this righteous young woman, she called the mother of the child, Moses' mother. Verse 9. And the daughter of Pharaoh said to her, uh, Will you go with the child, this child, and nurse him for me? So she's asking, will you go and do this for me? Now, who do you think would desire to nurse this young boy? Obviously, the mother. But she's being asked to do it. Now, here's what's important. Normally, the Hebrews would beseech the Egyptians. The Egyptians are the one with authority, power. This is who? This is Pharaoh's Pharaoh's daughter. And she doesn't command. She doesn't order. She could. But she says, will you go? The, The word is significant. By the way, it's the same word that begins chapter 2 when it says, and and Moses' father, we're talking about this, this Levite. Amram is his name. He goes, it says here, A man from the house of Levi goes and he takes a daughter of a Levite. What's the message here? We find this word go in this context is related to faithfulness. And God's faithfulness is being manifested through the daughter of Pharaoh. When she says to Moses' mother, Will you go with the child and nurse him for me? And notice The last part of verse 9, she says, and I will give your wage. Now, notice what's happening here. Now, we mentioned earlier on in our call to worship from the book of Isaiah, chapter 48 and verse 17, that when we make God to be our teacher, when he guides our life, he will guide us into prosperity. I'm not speaking about material prosperity alone, but he is going to equip us, provide for us what we need in our life. He is a faithful provider. And what we find is this, that God, because of the obedience of this woman, she did all she could. She wasn't listening to Pharaoh. 
She wasn't listening to the influence of others. She wasn't paying attention to the law of the Egyptians. She was doing what the fear of the Lord led her to do, to hide this child. And she did it to her fullest ability. But the scripture says when she could not any longer, she did something. And I agree with Chazal, that is, the sages of Israel, that she was led by God. It was through revelation that she built an ark like Moses, excuse me, like Noah built an ark in order for a new beginning. And because she obeyed, what happened? Well, she earned a wage. There was a response. There was a reward. The Hebrew word is schar, a reward. So Pharaoh's daughter says, I will give to you your wage. And the woman, here again, talking about Moses' mother, Yocheved, it says, and the woman took, this is what, the sixth time, the child and nursed her, nursed him. Now look at verse 10. Verse 10 will be our last verse tonight. And when we look at it, it emphasizes a change. Look at verse 10. And the child, the seventh time, and the child grew, and he was brought, she took him into the house of Pharaoh. So when no longer, no longer was she nursing him, she was, he, he was brought by her into brought to the daughter of Pharaoh, meaning into the house of Pharaoh. And he became to her for a son. Now, this is important because now she was raising him, but always with that influence, that influence from mother. And look again, verse 10. And he came to her, he became to her for a son. And she called his name Moshe. Why? Well, she said, because from the water uh, I draw him, meaning I took him up. Now, this is important. Because water, in the same way that we find the ark was brought out of the water. Into where? Brought up to a mountain. And in that same way, Moses was brought up from the water into a high place. What is that? The house of Egypt. Now, this is important for a very particular reason. The house of Pharaoh, it is a government. And we see that Moses was brought out of the water in order to enter into Pharaoh's house. This is a reference to the government. And this is to tell us that he was being prepared to be a leader, to be a ruler. God's providence, God's uh, plan was to influence Moses, to bring him up, that he might be a powerful leader. But don't forget about this identity. He never lost his Hebrew identity. He was not called to be a leader of the Egyptians, but a leader of the Hebrews. For what purpose? For the purposes of God. Now, here's the message that I want to close with, and that is this. We have faithful women in the book of Exodus. All of them are operating with the fear of the Lord. And this is true for Moses' mother. And her influence more than anything else, she instilled in Moses the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord, notice the scripture says in the Proverbs, it's the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to utilize the knowledge, the understanding of God to put it into action. And that's what Moses is going to demonstrate next week. That he is a man that's indeed moved by the truth of God, the wisdom of God, in order that he might carry out the purposes of God. So let me ask you this. 
Are you someone that is motivated through the fear of the Lord? And does that fear of the Lord produce wisdom, giving you the insight in how you're supposed to put truth into action with the objective, one objective, and that is that the will of God might be realized. And what we're going to find is this, that the will of God through Moses is to take the people out of exile, out of this world, and bring them into a promised land. Here's what I want to close with. We're going to see that there's an emphasis when we speak about God's purposes, his will, his establishment of his rule in this world, that is kingdom. There's always, 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 always a connection to the land of Israel. And it is so tragic today that we have too many people holding this book but do not understand the revelation of this book in regard to the significance of the land of Israel, that God has sanctified it. That means he has placed in this land purpose. And what Moses is going to do is that Moses, he comes out of Egypt, but he comes out alone. And he goes to the wrong location. And he does so alone. No, God's purpose. He gave him a Hebrew identity to be the redeemer of the Hebrew people with the purpose to bring them into a right relationship with God. Where is that found? In the wilderness. Why? Wilderness dependence upon God. The necessary preparation in order that the people get right with God, trusting God, believing in God, to enter into the land of God where they can begin to serve God. So let me say this. When we look at this book of Exodus, it's always to bring about a people prepared to serve God. So is that your objective? Is that your passion? To be someone who accomplishes the will of God, to think of yourself above all things as a servant of the Lord. That is what Moses is. Throughout this book of Exodus and on into Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, this man Moses, he was saved uniquely, the providence of God, positioned in Pharaoh's house in order that he might be used by God in order to accomplish the purposes of God. And how he was thought of in the scripture is the servant of God. What a wise thing to be. Are you striving to serve God? Well, I'll close with that until next week. Shalom from Israel. But before I say good night, I want to encourage you to remember at this time, in another uh, six or seven minutes, if you have Sirius XM radio, and there's 34 million people in the United States that do, you can go to Family Talk channel 131 on your radio and you can listen to our program lost in translation it's an hour program i begin the first half with the teaching and in that radio program we're dealing with the book of john and then the second half i'm joined with ronnie Houlihan and also dean kellio and tom levine as we speak about the Word of God and we want to learn more about what is lost in the translations so that we can understand the truth of God and apply it to our life. So again, those with Sirius XM, won't you listen? Tell a friend and also tell people about Midnight from Jerusalem. We're trying to do more and more to get biblical truth to, into the hands of more and more people. And we would be so grateful if you would participate with us by inviting a friend, sharing that. We're on multiple internet platforms in the United States. We're on numerous networks like Daystar, God TV, uh, um, Super Channel 55, GEB, and a host of others. 
both in America and throughout the world because we're committed to sharing the word of God to change lives and get them ready for a kingdom experience. Well, now I will close. Good night. Until next week, shalom. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.